All right. So it is just seven o'clock right now. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Pam Bond. I'm a board member with the Idaho Trails Association. And um, tonight I'll kind of be your host uh, for the Trail Master webinar this evening. And we uh, are going to have uh, Dan Isaac from the U.S. Forest Service chatting with us about um, climate change and our, our effects on public lands. But before we get started with Dan, I'm just gonna make a few general announcements and then talk a little bit about what ITA is. Um, if at any time you have questions for me or for Dan throughout the presentation, feel free to throw that up in the chat and we'll address those as we go along. All right, so um, if any of you haven't heard about it or, or haven't kept up on it or do know about it, thank you so much for voting um, and contacting our, contacting our representatives to get the Great American Outdoor Act passed. If you don't know what this is, um, it's a, a piece of legislation that passed that will help fully fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And then also we'll be providing dedicated money to address the backlog of maintenance on our public lands. And this does include trails. And um, this presentation is being recorded. So it's gonna be available to you later on our YouTube channel. And also we can make these slides available as well. So you can see there's a couple of links in here that will provide you with some information about the Great American Outdoor Act if you're interested. And that bottom link actually um, will show you a list of the projects that they're going to try and get funded in um, the next fiscal year using some of that money for the Great American Outdoor Act. And, and one of those projects does have to do with the deferred maintenance that has been happening in the wilderness complex in central Idaho. So that'll be really awesome. And I have a feeling that um, ITA may see some funding coming from that as well because they're always looking for partners to help with those projects. Um, if you haven't heard about the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation Trail Supporter Program, that is a new program that rail, rolled out on National Trails Day back in June. It is a voluntary donation-based initiative to secure much-needed funds for non-motorized trails in Idaho. So if you are interested in becoming part of a program, you can go to the website at the bottom of the slide to buy a sticker. I'm sure if you Google Idaho Trail Supporter Program, you'll also find it. I believe they're asking for a donation of $15, but you could always donate more and they will send you um, what this awesome sticker on the right hand side of the screen, they will send you a sticker that you can um, proudly display. Back in May, um, Outdoor Idaho actually did a show called Trailblazers and that is still available to be watched on online. And um, in that episode, they talked about some of the different groups, including ITA, that are doing um, trail projects in Idaho, helping keep our uh, non-motorized trails open and um, augmenting some of the work that the Forest Service and other public land managers are doing. And it's unfortunate, it's unfortunate to say that our uh, executive director, Jeff Halligan, is retiring at the end of the year. He's going to have some big boots to fill, but we are still um, looking for and accepting applications for the executive director position until September 18th. You can go out to our website, idahotrailsassociation.org, for more information and to apply. Please spread the word if you know anybody who may be interested or would be a good fit for that position. And I just wanted to remind you um, that the Idaho Trails Association Trail Reporter, a fairly new tool for us, is available for you. And really what this is, is we'd like for you to um, submit trail reports um, when, you're, when, you're, when you come back from your hiking trips. And really we're gathering information having to do with what the trail conditions are like. Um, if you're encountering any fallen trees, overgrown brush, we rolled this out in the spring and it was awesome to see people putting up comments about like snow and mud conditions. And with that, um, there is a, a map that you can find, the conditions trail reports map that you can go out and search and you can see the different reports that people have submitted. So you can not only submit reports, but you can also go out and look at the, the reports map before you go out on your own trail 
trail hiking adventures. And those are on our website as well. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of, of about ITA and why we exist, um, really it has to do with, um, you know, it's been over a decade now. You know, there was an acknowledgement that non-motorized trails are on the decline um, due to a lot of reasons. There's increase in wildfire. We have a lot of wilderness. We have a lot of non-motorized trails because of the wilderness. Um, they're, they're hard to get to. There's shrinking budgets and resources available to trails programs on public lands. And so there's really kind of this backlog of trail maintenance that needs to be done. Um, in 2017, the University of Idaho actually did a study looking at kind of the status of non-motorized trails on national forest in Idaho and very clearly stated that, you know, without, you know, more funding dedicated to take care of our non-motorized trails, they're going to just continue declining. So again, really awesome that the Great American Outdoor Act passed because I think that is going to help augment some of those, um, that deferred maintenance. Typically, I start out these presentations with a little video to entice you to sign up for some of our projects, but that doesn't always come across very well um, during a Zoom meeting, so I'm just going to throw it out there that we do have a YouTube channel. Um, you can go out there and you can see some of our promotional videos. Many of the um, webinars we do are recorded and also put out there, and you can just get an idea of the kind of presentations we do. If you have any ideas for future presentations, let us know. Um, but go ahead and go out there and check that out. And we are also on the other social medias, Facebook, Instagram. Find us out there. Follow us. You'll hear about upcoming projects and events, as well as seeing some awesome pictures from our different projects. So I'll tell you a little bit more about ITA. We were founded in uh, 2010. Um, yep, that means that this year is our 10-year anniversary. We would so, so love to do um, a big giant party, but because we can't, we've decided that next month, October, um, staying on the theme of 10 is going to be kind of our anniversary celebration month. So again, um, stay tuned for, so for more information about the goings on that we'll be doing um, next month. We're going to have probably some some different ways for you to get swag and um, just kind of be more involved with our group next month to celebrate our 10 years of existence. And so IT is really all about stewardship, tradition, education, preservation, stewardship. You know, we do this through caretaking of the land, doing um, non-motorized trail maintenance, tradition. And as you can see in this picture, we use crosscut saws. We don't use chainsaws for a number of reasons, but one of them has to do with alive. That's a traditional trail maintenance tool. Um, putting on presentations like this to educate folks about how to be responsible backcountry users and also um, about different things that are going on in our public lands. And then of course, preservation, you know, just again, the caretaking um, and passing on of the, the love of our public lands. So as you can see, since we started, um, the amount of volunteer hours and the amount of projects that we've done, done has increased tenfold. I, I believe in 2010, it started with one project. And I think this year we're probably well over 30, maybe 40 some type projects uh, happening throughout the season. And the season is getting longer and longer, starting earlier in the spring and going later in the fall to mush in all of these projects. Um, so how can you help? Uh, obviously, it'd be awesome if you want to become a member and um, really you become a member by signing up and maybe giving us a donation of some kind. And it's really any donation that is meaningful to you. We um, definitely recommend signing up for one of our trail projects. We do have some family-friendly projects, especially on National Public Lands Day, National Trails Day usually. Uh, single day, overnights, week-long vacation projects. We call them that because, um, you know, usually uh, we'll have projects where the we'll have stock pack in a lot of the supplies. We'll have a camp cook and you kind of get taken care of while you're out there. We have started a women-only weekends program where we do projects to encourage women to come out and try trail maintenance for the first time and also starting to do some youth week-longs. Um, We've also started doing monitoring projects in wilderness areas, looking for um, trail conditions 
and um, use site information and passing those along to the respective forest service districts. And then we also just ask that you be an advocate for our public lands and our public land resources, um, keeping up on what's going on with some of the legislation, um, making your voice heard when some of those things come about and um, you know, leave no trace while you're out on the land. So I did want to let you know that there are some, these are our final 2020 projects. Um, we have a WOW Women's Only Weekend this weekend. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please, please, please sign up today um, so that that trip can happen. We have a uh, multi-day trip happening in the Seven Devils. Um, there's a couple of trips in North Idaho, one on the St. Joe on the Sawtooth Trail, and then one for National Public Lands Day, which is September 26th at Evans Landing. And then bonus, if you're into hot springs, there's going to be a weekend trip on the North Fork Payette near like the Pine Pineville Hot Springs, working that section. So you'll get to work the trail and then get to do a nice long soak. And then last announcement is uh, just letting you know about our upcoming webinars, Hiking with Dogs. Um, that will be October 13th. Same format online, 7 p.m. Um, and then they'll be talking about the, the Three Blaze Trail on November 18th. If you haven't heard of the Three Blaze Trail, this is, this is a trail that has now become of uh, historic significance. And it has to do with, it was you know, created at the turn of the 20th century. Um, you know, basically to, to move through the wilderness from mining areas to, you know, established places. I believe the trail went from somewhere like Hamels Ferry to Big Creek or something like that. So straight through the wilderness. And there's been some work done to try and figure out um, exactly where that trail was. There's been a lot of burn. There's been a lot of trail degradation. And so I believe that the speakers will be talking about um, where that trail is, and um, what the uh, forest archaeologists have found. And as you can see kind of in this picture, in the, it's kind of hard to see, but the lower picture, that is an old three blaze. And the blaze is really just a cut in the tree. And uh, there were groups of people who were going out kind of looking for this evidence that it's still, still out there, still exists. So with that, um, we're going to transition over to Dan. And Dan, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let you start sharing. Okay. Okay. Can you just make your share and overwrite me? Because I'm not sure I can get my. Yeah. There we go. All right, Dan, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay. Is that coming through okay then for everybody? Yeah, so um, thanks Pam and Kelly and Idaho Trails for uh, this opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the research that um, myself and, and a bunch of folks in um, our laboratory in uh, Boise, Idaho have been doing on kind of climate change and how it's affecting aquatic resources in the Western United States uh, over the last 10 or 15 or so years now that we've really been focused on this topic. Um, and although we, we do kind of work all across the West, because we're located in Boise, we do have a really strong focus on you know, what's going on in, in the state of Idaho and in particular, you know, the species that um, make a home in, in the state of Idaho. So just want to talk a little bit about some of the trends that uh, we've been seeing um, in the measurement records and what some of the um, models are projecting things could look like for aquatic habitats and um, species persistence or distribution uh, going forward as, as climate change continues to progress. Um, you know, so just, just quick little bit of background, you know, we've all seen trends like this. Um, you know, this is just historical measurements of the Earth's temperature over the last 140 or so years. Um, and it's obviously just been getting warmer on average now pretty consistently for the last 60 or so years. Um, and then you can also look and think about, you know, what our carbon emissions into the atmosphere are, are doing in terms of uh, kind of baking into the cake, if you will, um, ongoing warming trends in the climate. And, you know, it, it basically just suggests that, you know, even if we were to um, go entirely to green energy and, and not have uh, fossil fuels be the base of our economies, um, you know, we've still got a lot of warming that's kind of built into the Earth's climate system now. And so, 
for the foreseeable future, um, at least through the middle of the century, uh, most likely through the end of the century, we're, we're anticipating that things are just going to continue to get warmer. And, and because this um, trend has been ongoing now for, for several, well, multiple decades, um, you know, environments in the natural world have been shifting and um, organisms are having to adapt. And, and there's kind of, you know, a basic set of, of ways that things are, are responding um, because many organisms have kind of very specific thermal niches or habitats that are tied to temperatures. As things get warmer, um, to maintain their thermal equilibrium or to track those habitats, uh, you would expect, and in fact, the evidence does suggest that um, things are moving towards higher elevations or towards the poles um, to just kind of track their, their thermal suitability. And, and there's been, you know, hundreds of different uh, peer-reviewed um, articles written about this and, you know, lots and lots of different review articles now that kind of pull together and synthesize this information. You know, same thing um, with regards to uh, species phenology or, or the times during the course of a year when um, important life history events happen. So um, you know, if you think about when flowers bloom in the spring or maybe when geese migrate in the fall, those are, those are sorts of phenological events. And here again, as things get warmer, um, that tends to accelerate or otherwise affect you know, the rate at which some of those annual developmental things happen for different species. And so we would expect to see shifts there. And that's, again, pretty well documented that that's occurring now for, for many species as they're trying to adapt to um, climate change and things getting warmer. And so when we, we think about those, those big global trends and you ask the question then, well, you know, in, in Idaho in the Northwest, we've got all these cold water species that, that are really important for um, you know, recreational fishing, for commercial fishing, um, for land and water use development, or, you know, in the case of some of these species that are already ESA listed, um, you know, that there's important consequences then for, for how, you know, many of the popular sport fishes um, that we care about in the state of Idaho um, are going to be affected by this. Um, and so I'm just going to gradually kind of step through, um, you know, a series of things that get to be a little bit more specific about how things um, are maybe changing across the region and then here within the state of Idaho and finally down to kind of the species level. Um, you know, this is just looking at what the um, weather stations across the Northwest where we're taking you know, temperature measurements um, on a continual basis. What those describe the um, regional trends as being um, here, we're just highlighting um, trends at those climate stations based on the rate of warming that, they are, that has occurred there over the last, or over this 40 year period from 1976 to 2015. And so during the summer season, uh, the months of June, July and August, Things have been getting warmer at the rate of about 0.35 degrees centigrade per decade. If you look at the bottom there, some of the other seasons of the year, things aren't warming up quite as fast, but during, during all seasons of the year, what we're seeing and measuring um, increasing temperatures at um, weather stations. And so that has consequences for you know, the hydrologic cycle and um, you know, the way in which water um, falls in the mountains and when it runs off and, and ultimately the aquatic habitat for, for salmon and trout. Um, you know, this is another study that, that was done you now 15 years ago, just looking at uh, what the empirical trends are at flow gauging stations across the Western United States. And so here they're just measuring you know, when you start to get kind of that first spring runoff event happening as it, as it warms up and you start to melt snowpack. And what this suggests is, is that basically you know, our, our rivers and our streams now run off several weeks to a month earlier than they did um, you know, in the middle of last century. And, and this trend, would just, we would expect this just to continue as it gets warmer, that things are going to run off earlier and earlier in the year. And, and what that does then in terms of you know, the amount of uh, flow there is in streams later in the year is it equates to less habitat during um, the warm summer months because you, you've melted and, and you've moved through that, that mass of uh, uh, precipitation that's related to the snowpack earlier um, and your, your tail end of your base flow period then starts happening earlier in the summer and you know, it just gets lower and lower um, the longer you go without um, having that accumulated snowpack to melt and run off again. So here, just looking at gauges within um, the Northwest, this is a colleague of mine in, in the, um, our research lab here in Boise, 
is just you know documenting that you know, summer flows over, over this uh, 60 or so year period have, have been dropping consistently um, by 20, 30 percent now over the last um, period of record. And what that does then too is is it um, means ultimately that our landscapes are getting to be drier. Um, they're getting to be drier sooner in the year and, and that dry period is lasting longer. And that in, in part then um, it helps account for the increasing um, extent and severity of wildfires uh, that we've seen across the West. And like, uh, you know, unfortunately the folks in uh, California are living through um, right now. Um, and you know, one of our little um, kind of local home basins, the Boise Basin is a place we do a lot of uh, our research in, in Southern Idaho. And this is just kind of the poster child for, you know, just burns on top of burns on top of other burns happening. And, you know, since the early 1990s, something like two thirds or three fourths of the surface area of that basin has experienced large burns. So um, but it's amazing that at this point now that you can still have fires occurring up there, um, but you, know, you get a lightning strike in the right stand of trees and that starts something off again during the dry part of the year, obviously. And one of the things then that that, that does, especially in, in you know, steep um, places like Idaho, um, where once you kill the trees on a hill slope and, and they slowly begin to um, die and, and their roots rot, then that tends to destabilize those hill slopes. And so then if you get a precipitation event falling on top of those um, hill slopes, it gets to be really easy to have um, hill slope failures and debris flows that, that come down the slope and out into uh, streams and rivers. And so uh, on the very right there, that, that just shows a deposition event into, I think that was the Payette River, um, where, where you're just spewing out of a small side channel, a, a big mass of gravel. And that's not necessarily a bad thing um, for fish. And you know, if you're a salmon that's coming back from the ocean, you know, those might be some fresh um, habitats that you could build a red on. Um, and that might be really good for um, you know, young salmon to uh, incubate in. But on the other hand, if you're uh, a resident fish um, that, that lives in those uh, smaller stream channels where these debris flows can come down, then that does have the potential basically just to, to wipe out a population because you get that <clears throat> flurry of sediment and, and wood and other things coming down these channels that there's really no way a, a fish um, can live through something like that. And of course, the other thing it does is um, you know, that sort of, of large catastrophic hill slope failure has obvious implications for um, infrastructure that's out on the forest, you know, whether it's forest roads or you know the trail systems that uh, I know trails is um, invested in, in maintaining. You just get more of these sorts of things that, that can kind of wipe things out and creates kind of a, a mess that has to be cleaned up or, or maintained uh, potentially more frequently. Uh, another big thing that, that we see happening uh, with regards to just the um, thermal regimes of rivers and streams across the region, you know, as the atmosphere is getting warmer, we would expect to see some of that heat energy finding its way in, into flowing waters. And, and that's what we see in the places where we've got the best long-term temperature records. Um, you know, Bonneville Dam is an example where now there, there's almost 80 years of uh, temperature that, that have been recorded since um, they built that structure in the, the late 1930s. And if you look at um, you know, just the trends there for, for the summer and the fall seasons, you've got a clear warming trend that's been occurring in the lower Columbia River. Um, but then also when we look at temperature records on rivers across the region, uh, that graphic in, in the bottom right, for the most part, you can see pretty consistent warming occurring uh, during many summer months. Um, there, there are a few instances where, where you'd get um, a cooling trend actually occurring, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but on that graphic where you see those blue circles, um, those are typically um, rivers that are immediately downstream of a high head dam. And so what um, water managers across the region are increasingly doing, it seems, is releasing more and more water during the summer in an attempt to keep the rivers downstream of those dams cooler, um, oftentimes for, for migrating salmon. Um, so, so an example of um, you know, fish distribution shifts that, that we're seeing in response to climate change um, here, here locally. Um, this is some research that came out of um, Western Montana um, in 2014, kind of the first time that this the data set was published. We, we've recently updated this with, with a much larger data set, but essentially what folks have done here is they've um, had an initial survey 
in I think the 1990s where they went out and they electrofished to determine whether or not bull trout were present in a stream. And then they went back to that site 20 years later and resampled the exact same sites. And then they just asked the question, you know, are bull trout persisting at these sites or do we see them dropping out of some sites or um, by chance colonizing more sites? And what they found um, is that in this particular basin, they're seeing about three times um, as many instances where bull trout are disappearing from a site as opposed to um, appearing in it for the first time. And, you know, bull trout are uh, ESA listed species that has a, has a really cold thermal niche. And so they're often thought of as kind of being the canary in the coal mine, um, at least from a fisheries perspective of the type of species we, we would expect to um, see kind of a climate response from. And so this seems to suggest that, yeah, in, in this instant, they are um, dropping out of some of these places. Um, but then even more telling than that is when they relate those places on the landscape where the species is um, disappearing to kind of the environmental conditions at those places, uh, the best predictors of that are elevation and stream temperature. And in both cases, um, what this is suggesting is bull trout is most probable to disappear from low elevation warm sites. So that pretty well backs up, you know, kind of what we would expect with regards to things getting warmer and, and species um, kind of having to contract into the headwaters is, is they're gonna do that first and foremost in the places where it's kind of already thermally a little bit marginal for them. Uh, with regards to salmon um, and kind of some of the phenological responses that, that they're exhibiting, um, here we've got nice long-term records, say from uh, the dams on the Columbia and the Lower Snake River, because each of those have um, fish counting windows so that when the fish are coming up over the dams and they're migrating through the fish ladders, um, you know, people are actually counting the number of fish and the um, species of fish that are moving past um, those ladders. So we've got good long-term trend data sets on, on when it is that uh, these, these migrations are happening. And so um, this is some work just documenting for sockeye salmon that migrate through uh, the Columbian Snake and into central Idaho to spawn at Redfish Lake, when it is that their migration has been occurring. Um, and since the 1940s, when, when this um, data set first began um, being compiled, the, their um, migration dates have shifted earlier and earlier. Um, and so now they're about three or four weeks um, earlier coming back from the ocean than they were historically. And what they think is happening here is that um, they're trying to um, get their migration done and get through the, those um, reservoirs on the Snake and Columbia before it gets to be too hot. Because the warmer it gets um, for, for sockeye and Chinook salmon, the greater the um, prevalence of disease and also the, the potential that you're gonna experience experience um, acute thermal stress that can, that can just kill fish outright. And so we're, we're, we're definitely seeing that, that trend happening uh, with our sockeye coming back to Idaho. Um, but th this ongoing warming then also sets up um, you know, potentially catastrophic years uh, like we had in 2015. So you know, as average conditions are shifting over um, each successive decade, that also means the extreme years associated with um, particular years can become a lot more extreme than they were historically. And you know, just five years ago, we had a perfect example of that. Um, we had what's called now in retrospect, um, a snow drought where we, we just had a really snow or a low snowpack across the region. Um, and many places of um, Oregon and Washington had, had no snow. And so, Coming out of that in the spring, that there was just no um, you know, big pulse of cold water that we usually get um, coming out of the mountains, um, and that salmon are used to experiencing when they're migrating back from the ocean. And so temperatures were just a lot warmer um, than they are usually, and they got to be a lot warmer earlier in the season. And so this graph is just showing temperature traces for the North Fork of Clearwater in North Idaho and that red line depicts what 2015 looked like relative to the other 36 years of uh, temperature data in that particular record. And so you can see it was just always on kind of the upper margins of anything that we've observed previously. And then you got into the month of uh, June, then it just, it shot way out uh, uh, much higher than uh, it, it's previously been the case. And what, by the time for migrating salmon, you get over 20 or so degrees Celsius, then they really do start to, um, 
um, experience a lot of uh, thermal stress and potentially, you know, if they're exposed to those temperatures for long enough, it can cause um, direct mortality. Uh, this is just another graph showing what was going on in 2015 relative to other um, climate years. This is for the Salmon River and temperatures there um, near Lewis, Idaho, relative to other years. So, you know, the salmon um, coming out of uh, June was running almost eight degrees Celsius warmer uh, than it normally is at that time of year. And so, fish that were migrating up through the uh, Columbia and Snake River, um, you know, sockeye and chinook populations, you know, they they just hadn't experienced anything like that um, previously. Um, it, it really did just um, do a number on, on our uh, salmon migrations that year. Um, in fact, they, they estimate that it was going to be a record return of adult sockeye salmon, at least since they started the restoration program to central Idaho that year, based on what they were expecting coming out of the hatchery and, and survival in the ocean. And then we got into that migration year and fish were, were literally just burning up in the river and they estimate that not a single adult sockeye would have made it back to Idaho unless they'd taken the emergency measures that they did, which was to capture the adults at Ice Harbor Dam as they entered the Snake River and put them in trucks and drive them back to central Idaho. So you know, they, they did manage to salvage a lot of adults and still um, were able to bring them into the hatchery and breed fish again that year. but it's, it's an example of potentially how extreme climate years can, can really have a devastating effect on, on some of these salmon migrations. And so not, not to make it entirely gloom and doom, I, I do want to um, also highlight the fact that there are a lot of things that can be done in terms of habitat improvements and restoration. Um, you know, we've done a lot of bad things to, to streams and rivers over the last century. And so by reversing some of those, especially if we do it strategically and in the right places that help the fish in the greatest way, then uh, potentially we, we can build some um, additional resilience back into, into these populations. So the, the key here really is just figuring out, given that we've got limited budgets to work with, um, you know, just like you do, say, when you're doing trail um, improvement or restoration uh, projects, you, know, you kind of have to pick and choose you know, where are you going to do um, invest those dollars to, to have the biggest um, positive effect for, for the resource that you're working with. And the same thing, you know, goes for aquatic species, you know, we need to pick and choose, you know, and ask questions about, you know, are all these different species um, potentially negatively affected by climate change, or maybe it's just a small number, and then say for um, that small number, maybe it's just certain places within um, their current distribution that they're going to be most vulnerable or, or less vulnerable. And, and the more precisely we can target those places um, that are most vulnerable, then we can um, you know, leverage the um, resources we do have to try to make the biggest um, positive um, outcome for these species. And so one of the things that, that we realized early on as we began you know, really trying to um, work in this area was that we didn't have very good um, climate scenarios for streams and rivers within Idaho or just the Western United States as a whole. Most of the data we were working with what was air temperature data that was just kind of adapted to working in, in streams and rivers, but in places that have a lot of topographic relief like Idaho, you get all kinds of microclimate things going on and, and, it, and there's no, there's not a very strong relationship a lot of time between elevation or air temperature and stream temperature. So, so we wanted to build um, our own climate scenarios to kind of really represent more precisely what was going on in, in our rivers. Um, and here, luckily, we had um, a lot of groups that had already been collecting data because they've been concerned you know, for a long time before people were even thinking about climate change and fish, just about temperature and fish because it is such an important driver um, for them. So lots of different groups had, had collected temperature data sets over the previous decades. It's just that they'd all kind of operated independently and, and no one had put this data together into a big centralized database that could uh, be used for something like creating climate scenarios. So we, we got a little bit of funding for this um, Norwest stream temperature project, built a database team and pulled together um, all these stream temperature data sets um, across the Western US and then use that to fit a model and to build high resolution climate scenarios. To look at what stream temperatures were like throughout um, all the rivers and streams in the region and uh, you know, what they were Berkeley, what they are now, and, and make projections about what they could look like in the future. 
And then we put all that information on a website so that it's publicly available and we can um, you know, engage our partners in this sort of project and, and have them use the uh, database projects or um, products from the database. And then you know, ultimately what, what we use those climate scenarios for is to make better information about you know, the different aquatic species that we're working with that we think might be more um, susceptible to climate change. So this is just an example of kind of how we've done that for um, two native trout species within Idaho, um, bull trout and cutthroat trout. We essentially combined information about where they occur on the landscape with these um, stream temperature scenarios, you know, added in some additional variables and then built models that kind of link the two and the model just creates you know, a mathematical equation for um, predicting one from the other. And we can use that then with um, geospatial software to make predictions about you know, where are the streams that are most likely to support um, you know, these two species now and in the future. And by being able to map out those probabilities across the range of say bull trout in this example, um, it allows us to highlight you know, the subset of streams that are most likely to serve as long-term climate refugia for these species. Um, and so here we're, we're just depicting kind of a baseline climate scenario for bull trout. And we're color coding the different streams across their range by different probabilities or, or habitat suitabilities. And so the blue streams have a high habitat quality um, prediction. The yellow streams have kind of an intermediate quality prediction and the red streams have a, have a low probability, but still some suitability um, for bull trout. And this is under a baseline climate scenario. And we can tie this then to the global climate models to look at you know, what then a, a future warmer environment means for bull trout. And we can map that out you know, specifically on individual streams across the full range. And what this has showed us is that you know, even for species like bull trout, which is really thermally sensitive, um, you know, there is some hope um, because even under an extreme climate change scenario, we can highlight um, streams within central Idaho, um, you know, the wilderness areas up in Northwest Montana, the Northern Cascades, uh, the Blue Mountains of uh, Northeast Oregon, you know, that there are gonna be some streams that have a, have a high probability of serving as long-term climate refugia um, for the species. And we communicate them, that information then to um, local conservation groups that are interested in preserving that species or Fish and Wildlife Service or Forest Service to kind of point out what, what those um, special um, watersheds and streams, where those may be. And then again, what we you know, package this information as map data and put it on a website so that people can download it and use it in their decision-making process. And we found that, you know, managers and, and conservationists really like that because then, then they've got a way to tie um, you know, some of the restoration activities they're trying to do on the landscape to um, this broader picture. And they can see kind of how their tree fits within, within the broader context of, of the forest of trees. And so ultimately what we would like to do is be able to do that, that same level of um, habitat suitability mapping and highlighting of climate refugia, you know, not just for a small number of um, trout species, but essentially for anything that, that lives in Idaho's streams and rivers. And so for a long time, that, that was kind of hard to do because one, one of the um, big um, data requirements that we have for that is, is presence absence information um, that historically has been collected you know, using uh, electrofishing or you know, kind of specialized sampling gears that for the most part, uh, fish and game agencies and, and maybe some federal agencies have um, access to, but the general public um, doesn't. But that, that all changed you know, starting about oh, five to 10 years ago when uh, a new sampling technology was developed that involves this filtering um, DNA out of the water. And from that, um, those filters then, you can extract information about any sort of uh, fish species or macroinvertebrate or mollusk that lives in that water body. And it's also um, a really easy protocol to follow to be able to train people up to, to collect this sort of information. Um, and so that's allowed us to really democratize um, how we're collecting now um, some of these data sets um, to move towards that um, you know, future where we can make more precise information about how climates affect many different things besides just um, bull trout species. 
another really nice thing about this technology is, is that, you know, all the equipment that you need to collect a sample can be carried in a day pack. And so one person constitutes an entire sampling crew. And, and you know, over the span of a day, you, you can hike an entire stream, collect a series of samples along that stream, and you pretty much um, then nailed down the distribution of, of a bunch of different species in that stream. And by you know, making this broadly available to folks from a lot of different groups that are interested in um, aquatic species, then we're trying to build bigger and bigger databases. And so a few years ago, we, we launched this project called the Aquatic eDNA um, Atlas website. And this hosts you know, a bunch of information about eDNA sampling, but also hosts um, you know, geospatial data sets that kind of show just a broad generic sampling grid for where samples could be collected, um, as well as results from uh, previous samples once those have been brought into the laboratory and processed. And so you know, right now we've got you know, more than 17,000 sites uh, across the Western US that have been sampled. Um, we've got information on about 40 different species and, and we've really kind of built this momentum behind this now to where it's kind of an organic thing that, that um, just is continuing and, and growing and, and we're getting thousands of additional um, samples collected uh, each year. And, and then we make that information available through just you know, online web tools that make it possible to access the data, download it, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this is just an example for um, another sensitive species um, within uh, the Idaho and the region more broadly that people have been concerned about and, and just an example of how some of these efforts can spin up pretty quickly because we didn't really start working with Pacific lamprey until 2018. Um, a lot of different groups were interested in getting better information about their distribution and abundance and, and we ended up with a lot of project partners and now we've pretty well done a good job of mapping the entirety of where um, this critter occurs within um, Idaho, at least the river basins where it has access because it is an anatomous species and getting a better and better um, picture of where they occur within um, Oregon and Washington. And as we do that, then we, we just kind of go through the same process with them that we did with uh, bull trout and cutthroat trout, you know, to link that information to GIS data sets, build models, map out the probabilities of them occurring, and then ultimately trying to highlight um, you know, where the climate refuge streams are and then you know, ultimately where the best opportunities may be for restoration projects to help that particular species. Um, well, one thing I haven't really talked about, and, and you know, it, it's especially for our anadromous um, salmon species or steelhead um, that are leaving the state and going out um, to grow and, and mature in the ocean before they migrate back. You know, the 900 pound gorilla for, for them, even before we thought about um, climate change ha has been the out of basin factors associated with the large dams and reservoirs on the Lower Snake River and Columbia River, um, because those do take a toll in terms of um, causing mortality to juveniles that are migrating out. And then they also create kind of these stagnant um, lakes that have high predator populations that um, you know, will also feed on, on uh, juveniles. And it also, those tend to make the system a lot warmer than it was historically. And so, you know, that, that's something that even if we focus on and um, you know, take care of habitat conditions within the state of Idaho, you know, this is still going to be kind of the Achilles heel for um, these anadromous species that have to leave the state and come back to um, complete their life cycle. So here, you know, there are still things that we can do um, in terms of improving the habitat quality, but you know, it, it does get to be a lot harder um, to cool a large river like the Snake or Columbia than it does some of these smaller headwater tributaries. Um, that said, you know, there are instances where things are being done um, to try to make the, these environments cooler during especially that um, acute summer warm period. And so, for example, um, you know, Dwarshag Dam that's on the North Fork of the Clearwater in North Idaho, um, since the 1980s, they, they've essentially modified the um, times of year that they release water from that in an effort to cool down the lower um, Snake River during the peak salmon migration periods. And so the, the Dorshak is a tall enough dam that it creates a really cold um, hypolimnion um, down low underneath the surface water. And that cool water then can be drawn out as kind of an artificial iceberg to cool down um, you know, those further downstream reaches of river. 
Um, and, and there's also options now that are being studied, you know, especially the, the um, lower Columbia River has, has opportunities maybe to create kind of artificial stepping stone um, cold water refugia. So Drano Lake is a place where you've got a large tributary coming in from the Cascades uh, on the north. And then you've got a road cut that goes across um, that that forms kind of a, a little bit of a barrier that keeps that water from mixing with the main stem uh, Columbia River. And so that creates you know, kind of a little um, cold lake that's adjacent to the main river and the fish when it gets to be really warm they'll just stack into that and kind of hunker down until it, the main river cools down a little bit and then they'll continue their migration. So people are examining whether it's not possible to create maybe some more of those sorts of stepping stone habitats. And then another thing that has really come back into the discussion the last few years is just the possibility of maybe um, you know, breaching the lower Snake River dams. And so this is something that you know, they, they first were talking about doing in the uh, early 1990s when they were debating whether or not um, some of the salmon runs coming back to Idaho should be listed under the Endangered Species Act. And at that time, you know, it, was, it was kind of poo-pooed and, and not taken too seriously just because you know, there, there's you know, a lot of electricity generation that comes from those dams. They're also used for transporting grains to and from market. And so, you know, people, even though it was put on the table, I don't know that they took it all that seriously. More recently now that we're starting to worry about climate change and we've got, um, you know, wind and solar growing extremely rapidly um, to the point where they're disrupting regional um, electricity and energy markets. I think people are starting to look at this um, a little more seriously. That there's still going to be, you know, questions and, and things that would have to be accommodated in terms of, say, moving grain to and from market. But um, you know, it could be the, that we reach a point in, in future decades where we've got enough of a surplus um, in terms of electricity from these other sources that don't include hydro that this does um, become a somewhat more feasible option in the future. If you do that, you, you'd, you'd probably cool down the, the lower snake a lot, and, and that would um, you know, go a long ways towards eliminating some of these uh, problems that, um, or impairments that happen to uh, our salmon populations when they're outside the state. Uh, so that's, that's about all I've got, um, but I did want to mention a couple ways that um, folks could get involved with some of this. If you're um, you know, a diehard that's really into um, fishing for, for um, salmonids and you want to find some way to help. Um, you know, Trout Unlimited is a great national organization, but they've also got local um, chapters. So I think um, in, in the valley here in, in South Idaho, the Ted Trueblood chapter is the local one. I think there's another one up in Moscow. And they're always involved with doing um, uh, fundraising efforts and, and habitat restoration projects. You know, again, prioritizing where they can do the most benefit for um, local fisheries and then going out and actually achieving that. Um, so they've got a couple websites you can visit. Also, you know, if you're interested in uh, maybe helping to collect some of these eDNA samples, this is something that, you know, th there's a lot of places, even though it looked like that map of Idaho I put up had just, you know, a blanket sample across everything. Once you actually zoom in, there, there's a lot of streams and rivers in our state that don't have any samples taken from them yet. And so it's really easy to go out and, and you know, get trained up. It takes only about 10 minutes to figure out how to um, collect a sample. We can provide a lot of the sampling materials. And then as you're hiking along some of your favorite streams, um, you can be collecting uh, samples and contributing those to the database and this broader region effort. And if you're interested in uh, maybe doing a little bit of that, um, either later this fall or next summer sometime, just uh, feel free to uh, contact me. Uh, and so I guess this is the last slide, but um, you know, in terms of salmon and trout, cold water species, other aquatic species in the state of Idaho, you know, we're just kind of in this mode now where we're assuming that it's, it's just gonna continue to get warmer for um, probably the rest of this century. And so we're, we're trying to just really build these databases. So we've got good information on where these species occur, uh, the types of habitats they like, translate that in, into models that we can use to predict and, and really highlight um, some of these climate refuge streams so that um, our land managers can go about you know, protecting those when they're doing forest plan revisions or, or they're figuring out um, fishing regulations, those sorts of things. So appreciate your time today and uh, the opportunity to chat with you. And I guess if, if there's still time, I, I could uh, probably take some questions. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Dan. That was really interesting. It's, you know, um, 
nothing speaks louder than data sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cut and dry sometimes. Um, so let's see if, if there's anybody has any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A or the chat window. Not seeing any, not seeing any just yet. Yeah, and I'm glad that uh, in the end there you brought up, I mean, you can't, you can't really think about um, anadromous fish without thinking about dams. <laughs> it seems to, um, I, I, I used to work for the Department of Fish and Game, and there were many, many conversations around these, these, and people would ask me questions about that all of the time. So it was interesting. And that's something that I didn't, didn't know really that with the new, you know, alternative energy sources, that that could potentially be, you know, something that could maybe make breaching those dams possible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for a long time, um, you know, the hydroelectricity coming out of the um, Lower Snake and Columbia rivers and, and that BPA puts on the market was always the lowest cost um, on the uh, on the grid. And now that there's such a surplus a lot of times coming out of um, California that uh, it's actually being undercut. And so it's, it's <laughs> the ironic thing is it, it it hurts their budget, BPA's budget, and then that hurts the amount of money that they can spend on wildlife and fisheries programs in the region. So, you know, it, 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 the process of being disrupted now, and it's, it's not straightforward exactly how it all falls out, and it's not going to all be 100% good, it's looking like, but yeah, at the same time, it could open up some other really big opportunities going forward. Um, and it, it's been interesting, too, just the last year or so to hear a slightly different tune coming out of um, the political leadership in Idaho. Um, you know, within the region, we, we've always kind of been, you know, a more conservative state and, and our politicians reflect that. Um, whereas Oregon, Washington, they're, you know, very proactive environmentally and, and been pushing for salmon. Um, but, you know, Governor Little and then um, both, I think, Crapo and um, I forget who else, but, you know, they've made comments to the effect saying that, you know, we need to really look at this a little more closely and um, understand you know, the value of Idaho's salmon populations and see if, you know, there aren't some things that we have been overlooking that we should try harder to do in the future, including things like breaching, taking it more seriously than they have in the past. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And without the... Oh. Seems like my voice is maybe reverbing. <laughs> See if I shut it off and turn it back on. That seems better. So, um, you know, one thing that I thought was really interesting when I was working for the Department of Fish and Game, I, I was I was mostly working well in wildlife and doing GIS work, but I definitely had some exposure to the fishery stuff. And it really you don't know how much like data collection and research goes into all of that either. I mean, anadromous fisheries, just like research monitoring is, a, is like a pretty hands-on deal. You know, I mean, those fish, you, they, people basically know the movement of those fish from the time they're born and they're these little teeny fingers of a fish and they put a little tracker in it and then they let it go <laughs> and then it somehow makes it down to the ocean and along the way they may end up with another antenna or some like gill plate something or other or some kind of tattoo on their eye or something and by the time they're a big full-fledged fish and they come back up they've got all these accessories and jewelry attached to them just just so we can kind of keep track of of where they're all going and what they're doing it's pretty impressive yeah, unfortunately, that's been the long-running joke in the fisheries community, too, is that by the time they're endangered, then uh, the biologists come in to do the, the final studies that just push them over the edge with all those accoutrements. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, really interesting to see. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not, I'm not seeing any other, other uh, questions here in the chat, but again, thank you so much for your time. Really interesting stuff. And um, yeah, some food for thought for sure. Well, great. Thanks for having me. Good luck out on the trails there. Yeah, thanks a lot.